We are now located at that moment in time when one, le one ruling state is about to give way to another. That the state of Israel is about to replace the United States as the ruling state in the world. When Israel takes over from the United States with that big war which is about to take place and the American economy collapses and the US dollar collapses and all the paper money in the world collapses and this is going to be my lecture next Wednesday inshallah on Islam and the international monetary system, please come to it. Then we see that transfer of power. Israel takes control of the oil, for example, of the Middle East. When Israel becomes a ruling state in the world, then the Jews will say, the golden age has come again. The prophecy is being fulfilled, but they're being deceived in the grandest and most magnificent deception mankind has ever witnessed. No, this is not the golden age. You have been deceived by Al Masihud Dajjal. us who studied any history at all knows that's exactly how World War I took place. Then World War II was fomented between the Zionists, uh, between the German nationalists again and the Brits to bring us in and in World War II, Israel was to be born. And the Zionists were given power. So since the first two wars came off, just exactly as that letter said, and that letter used to hang right in the British Museum Library until 1977 when Baron Rothschild became a director. And as soon as he was on the board of directors, that letter disappeared from the library immediately. But since that letter so clearly delineated the first two world wars, I think we have to look at it seriously and take it to heart when it says in there so clearly that the third world war will be fomented between the Zionists and Islam. Does anybody see that materializing today? Every place we look, we can see it happening. And we can see the power they have here in this country to run things and to pull the nastiest little scams and America believes it. Because they don't realize who it is that owns the newspapers. They don't realize who it is that owns the television. And sometimes they don't care. As long as there's going to be football on the Monday night and I got beer at hand, that's all that counts. So there, we have figured it out. Go back to bed, America. Your government has figured out how it all transpired. Go back to bed, America. Your government is in control again. Here, here's American gladiators. Watch this. Shut up. Go back to bed, America. Here is American Gladiators. Here is 56 channels of it. Watch these pituary retards bang their fucking skulls together and congratulate you on living in the land of freedom. Here you go, America. You are free to do as we tell you. You are free to do as we tell you. Okay, we say we've got freedom of press in this country. And some folks have said that uh, you've got freedom of press as long as you own it. Well, who owns the media? And when I say that, not, I, I mean it not literally, but as far as who controls the information that goes out in the media. An example, NBC is owned by General Electric. And General Electric is one of the top 10, if not top five, defense contractors. 
Is NBC going to expose a news story that might in some way impede a contract negotiation which can mean a lot of money for General Electric? I don't think so. So the point here is that we have elected officials, both Republicrats and Demopublicans, that cater to who? Certainly not the common people. We don't have the huge amounts of money to contribute to their election campaigns. The people that contribute the most amount of money are the corporations. And so that uh, representative or senator is going to do what is going to be in the best interest of those corporations. So if the corporations are controlling and influencing our elected officials, we must also take a look at the mainstream media. Who pays the bulk of the advertising dollars that keep the mainstream network news going? <laughs> is the major corporations. So what we have now is we have corporate control of elected officials, corporate control of the media, and this is why some people are now calling it the corporate Borg, because they have assimilated several different areas of our entire society. The corporations control agriculture, technology, manufacturing, industry, education, communication. They control our elected officials. This is not a government of, by, and for the people. It is a government of, by, and for the corporation. And by definition, when business controls government, that is inescapably fascism. And then if the global currency crisis unfolds, then inevitably you get, uh, I guess, an alignment under a, a global world government, uh, a new global currency, um, and a new world order. Uh, so we may be moving towards that. It's impossible to predict the time when confidence will be lost, but it can come quickly. Resorting to buying other paper currencies will not be of much help. When the dollar crashes, most likely the purchasing power of all currencies, since all currencies hold dollars as a reserve, will go down as well. This means that dollars and other currencies will go into buying consumer items, precious metals, and other physical properties. Consumer prices will soar as well as interest rates. The central bank will lose control, and the more they inflate, the worse the confidence becomes. The interest rates will respond to these efforts by rising sharply. If the Fed tries to reverse the run on the dollar, interest rates will also soar, and the pain on American citizens will be of such proportion that political chaos will result. Either scenario leads to political and social chaos, the third event, and the most dangerous. With no ability of the federal government to fund its commitments, international or domestic, major changes will occur in our system. The social unrest will elicit cries for government to exert unusual force to head off a complete breakdown of law and order. The ultimate trap will be set for a system of government, claiming to protect a free society. If more power and police authority are not given to the federal government, it will be argued that only anarchy will result. If more government policing power is given, it will mean a lethal threat to civil liberties. Already, we have permitted the notion that a single person, the Attorney General or the President, can decide who is an enemy combatant, thus denying that individual the right of habeas corpus, permitting indefinite detentions without charges made. This attitude towards civil liberties has changed significantly since the fear built around 9-11. Yes, I know, declaring one an enemy combatant is reserved only for the radical Muslims engaged in terrorism against the United States. To be reassured by this reasoning is quite dangerous and naive. Logic should not lead us to equate suspects with terrorists and include American citizens. And yet, this has already been set by precedent. Under difficult circumstances, our political leaders will not be hesitant to use these powers to maintain order. Tragically, the people may even demand it. We are rapidly moving toward a dangerous time in our history. Society as we know it is vulnerable to political and social unrest. This impending crisis comes as a consequence of our flawed foreign and domestic economic policies, a silly notion about money, ignorance about central banking, and ignoring the onerous power and mischief of out-of-control intelligence agencies our unsustainable welfare state and a willingness to sacrifice privacy and civil liberties in an attempt to achieve safety and security from an inept government. Dangerous times indeed. What can be done about it? Must we wait for the inevitable and expect to restore our liberties in a street fight against the overwhelming power of the state? Not a good option. 
the only way that we, we can prevent blood from running in the streets is to offer a better idea of the proper role of government in a society that desires first and foremost liberty.